Welcome back to the Locks Lounge with your boy, your host, Tim Nicholas. Tonight, I'm excited because we are in Baltimore, Maryland with some amazing men and women who are doing great things in the Baltimore community. It's always good to come home to just see people doing their thing. And I am definitely blessed to be here with three great individuals that are doing their thing for sure. Now, not only that, we got fit moms in the house. <laughs> we got fit dads in the house. So, you know, it should be just a good time as tonight we're going to really dive into some health and wellness topics. We're going to talk through some things about living in the black community, co-parenting. I mean, we, we got a gauntlet for y'all tonight for sure. So without further ado, I want to introduce you to uh, Miss Erica Lewis. How you doing, Miss Erica? Hello there. Hi, guys. How you hey. doing? Happy Tuesday. <laughs> Happy Tuesday to you, too. Now, just a little bit about Miss Erica. She is doing great things. She works for um, a nonprofit organization called Living Classrooms. So we'll get into her background. She, she definitely has been gracious to allow us this amazing space. So thank you again very much, Erica. Of course. Appreciate it. And also, you have um, a... Um, another nonprofit called Hike to Heal. Yes. Right. Yeah, um, so that's that's really dope. Sure. Yeah, so Hike to Heal is uh, my baby. It's still an infancy stage, but it is a nonprofit that just focuses on healing in nature, which is, I, I feel like we all could need some healing. So yeah. That's dope. That's dope. It's definitely a... Um, I wouldn't even say outside the box thing, but for black people, it probably is a little outside the box. <laughs> but it's mad dope, though. Mm-hmm. So shout out to you with your business and, and your businesses and what you're doing. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, so we have another newcomer to the show. Her name is Miss Kathy Robinson. How you doing, Miss Kathy? I'm doing good. How are you? Great. Thank you so much for coming mm-hmm. on. No problem. Thank you for having me. Yes, ma'am. So a little bit about Miss Kathy. I'm going to scratch that out. So a little bit about Miss Kathy. She is a school counselor for Baltimore City Public Schools. Mm-hmm. You're also into fitness very much so. Um, you're also an HBCU and a master's grad. You went to shout out to Morgan State. Yes, Morgan State. <laughs> <laughs> so and you, and you also graduated from Loyola, correct? Yes, okay. Loyola, yes. Well, ma- ma'am, you have done your thing educationally, you know, so shout out to you big time. Thank you. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. So appreciate y'all coming on as far as the ladies. Mm-hmm. But last but not least, I got a good brother right here. Uh, okay. This guy, <laughs> Mr. Will Moore. What's up, man? Mm-hmm. How you doing, brother? Mm-hmm. Man, let me tell you a little bit about Will. Will uh, and I, we grew up in church together. And uh, it's just good to see guys that, you know, kind of came up from under me or from behind me, I say. And just as far as just how he's been conducting himself as a worker, as a father, and you got an upcoming podcast coming up pretty soon, too. So, you know, shout out to you, my man. Send the words. Appreciate it. Yes, sir. Well, you know, I'm here for any advice. You know, I'm new to this game. Right. So, you know, if there's anything I can do to help out, you already know you got my number. Okay. Yes, sir. All right. All right, y'all. So, we're going to just dive right into it. Um, the Locks Lounge is based on, you know, lock professionals, natural hair, also just people in the community, pretty much. And um, we all know that barbershops and beauty salons are like the cornerstone of the community. So I'm gonna start with the ladies. I'm gonna start with you, Kathy. What was your first experience going into the beauty salon as a, as a young lady? Um, I would say definitely getting a relaxer. Getting a relaxer was my first experience going. Um, and I just remember it being an exciting experience at that time. Like at that time, getting a relaxer was like a, a rite of passage. Mm-hmm. Um, but then, you know, after that, you know, the, the care that comes with it, being in the hair salon for a really long time. And then also um, something that I personally struggled with for a long time was getting my ends clipped. So it was like, I did not want my ends clipped. <laughs> I felt like you were cutting my hair off, not realizing that that's gonna actually help it, you know, be healthy. Um, so I would say overall, you know, my experiences in the hair salon has been good. Um, but growing up, it was definitely like a rites of passage type thing. I just remember it being very crowded and hot and like all the steam, you know, from all the, the flat irons and hair curlers. So, a lot of, uh, yeah, a lot of artillery going on. Feels in this mm-hmm. <laughs> That's real dope. Mm-hmm. Definitely love to hear, hear first time experiences. Mm-hmm. For sure. How about you, Miss Erica? What was your experience like? It's not much different, but it was definitely uh, Easter weekend. Um, I didn't get a perm, but I got a my hair straightened. So I don't know if you guys know anything about that. That's when they put the, the comb and you got to hold your ear. Oh, yeah. Oh um, I just remember me holding my ear and still getting clipped. <laughs> the back of my ear had a little burn. Uh, the smell, the, the long wait. Um, 
And I honestly, I, I never had a love for hair salon. Like after that, I just never wanted to go back. It just was never my thing. So your experience was not an enjoyable experience, it sounds like. No. I, I think even back when I was like a little kid, I, just hearing the talks about hair and how much pressure it was on like black women to like keep their hair a certain way, I just was always a rebel. So I'm just like, nope, I don't want to go. That's <laughs> real. That's real. Yeah, well, you know, sometimes those experiences, they like, yeah, uh, I'd rather do my hair at home. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I can understand mm -hmm. just, you know, being in, you talking about being in a hot, location just mm -hmm. with all the sisters and the stuff going on and the the heat. chemicals chemicals, the chemicals. Yes. The chemicals. yeah seriously and then you know with you same thing just like being a rebel and not really, really enjoying that experience so mm -hmm. it's like that sometimes mm -hmm. sure mm -hmm. mr will how about you what was it like going into the barber shop the uh, first to time? be honest i had it backwards i went to the dude's shop before i went to the barber shop okay because my pops he grew up cutting hair so he cut everybody here in the neighborhood already so he cut his own son hair well, I remember getting up when you know he had to work on Saturdays, going my mother, my sister to the beauty salon, wow. and I kind of took from that. Like I wound up eventually, by like ten years old, I was working in the beauty salon, making little change on the side, yeah. and then my father told me how to cut hair. But then I got to the point where I was just like, I'm about to go to the barber shop. And when I started going, it was just, it was just like you find out everything in the barber shop. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, it's, I mean, and then like I said, the best of both worlds because. On one side, you hear with the ladies the, in the beauty shop, you hear all their drama. All the and things. then it's like you go to the barber shop, you in there with their husbands, and you hear their side. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that kind of right there just gave me like some knowledge and as far as my maturity level, I guess, kind of. I picked up on it a lot. So I learned my hustle. I learned how to grind and all that stuff through like just both experiences, you know, just to. And, you know, as a child, I mean, I was one of the kids that listened to adults really when it came to like wisdom lines. So, just to hear like both sides, like a female perspective and a male perspective on life, it kind of gave me like the tools and the things I needed in order to like, grow, grow better. That's what's up, man. You had the best of both worlds. You was able to go into the beauty shop, hear the ladies mm -hmm. talk, and hear, hear what they expect from the men. And then you hear the stuff from the guy side, like, man, she ain't shit. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, it, it be like that sometimes. So, mm -hmm. man, that's dope, for real. Man, I like that. All right, so let me ask y'all this question, um, and it could be anybody, pretty much, right? Do you think that the younger generation takes hold of the barbershop and the beauty salon experience like we did growing up? Um, I think now hair care is so personalized now. Um, like you said, a lot of people are doing their own hair at home, watching YouTube, learning what our particular hair needs, and then also, you know, girls aren't getting relaxed with, like, to, you know, we're natural. Um, so I would say their perception might be a little bit different because, again, I'm feeling like from my experience with my own daughter, it's very personalized, it's like a one on one situation, or maybe it's two clients and that's it. So I'm, I don't think they might have the same the same view. And then also, you know, hair braided, it's just so many different factors. I definitely mm -hmm. think salon suites have changed, like mm -hmm. the atmosphere of like what we grew up seeing because, mm -hmm. like, the tea. <laughs> that you get in a salon suite is completely different than you sitting under the dryer and hearing, yes. you know, people talk about their marriage and church the next day mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And I, I think also, like, the younger girls, which I find is beautiful, they're not running to firms. No. You know, they're learning how to actually, take like, care take care of their hair, mm -hmm. um, watch YouTube and, mm -hmm. you know, save coins and things like that. Mm -hmm. For me, I go to the barber shop now because my tail on Emerson Avenue, I go down there. There's a younger cat that owns the barbershop. My cousin, my first my cousin, he works in there. And they all been like a little bit like it's three of them. They've been together for like years now. So they just they more so into like, you know, we starting the game but we gonna do it forever. So every black like, young man that comes through the shop, they got a guy in the back with those tattoos, man. They got a young lady that comes in and does her hair in another room. So he trying to open up, you know, different suites and stuff and helping people that have talent to do these things give them a safe place to work. So when other people come in, I, I hear it all the time, like the young generation come in and they um, ask some questions and stuff like, how you get this? Oh, this crazy. I've never seen somebody get laid or something like this. And you tell them like, how to keep it, how to keep it going, what it takes to even get to this point. So I feel like now it's kind of like, well, back in the day when I used to go to the barber shop, the older guys who just, you know, talking about everyday life, but I feel like now, based off of their conversations, the younger gener generation, like we picked up on it. So now we want to, people underneath us to do the same thing for you. Yeah, that's real. 
it is, and that's the that's the difference from back in the day. Like it was everyday life. We're talking about the struggle, the grind, but the hustle. And I think now, just from my own personal experience, it's not as the same in my opinion because you have like a lot of a lot, a lot of times barbers are just trying to make money, I'm trying to just they're just trying to make the money as opposed to really having a personalized relationship. And I think that's still important. Like you're still in the people business, mm-hmm. so you still got to make sure that you are conduit to the community. You're still talking to people, you're still wanting to know about them. Because at the end of the day, you're building that relationship. So I like I, I think it still has some of an impact, but I do think that even with the the new idea with the salon suites now, mm-hmm. YouTube videos, those like types of things now, it makes it a little less personalized. Mm-hmm. Twenty twenty two. Mm-hmm. It changed a lot. Those book and fees. Absolutely, absolutely. So, Miss Erica, can yes. you please tell us a little bit about yourself? Okay, crap. Um, you're an editor, right? <laughs> okay, cool. Um, so, I am a Baltimore native. Uh, I've grown up uh, in Baltimore majority all of my life. I, my family is from Patterson Park area. Uh, my mom moved out to Pikesville, so I kind of had the opportunity to see both sides of like city life, um, and then I was kind of nurtured in the suburban world. Um, I have a heart for people, um, whether it's like I felt like growing up in church, I used to think that was the only way to serve, um, but now that I've gotten older, I've kind of realized like you can serve in your capacity everywhere you go. So like my heart is for people um, I have children. Um, that I absolutely love and adore. And I love being outside in nature. I love being a, a vessel for people to heal. Um, a lot of the times when I'm walking outside, it's like therapy for some of my girlfriends. Like we talk more about life outside than we probably do over the phone. So that's a little bit about me. It's dope. I love it. I love it. So, you know, let me just first start off by saying this. I hate hiking. Remind me again. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's not that I dislike the idea of hiking. It's nothing like that, right? I just have asthma. So how it makes We can me- get you like a one miler, you know, like a <laughs> lower incline. It doesn't have to a be lower anything. incline. Yes. I, I think it's dope to do nature things. Mm-hmm. Definitely to, to be out, you know, camping trips, hiking, you know, mountain climbing. That type of stuff is cool. Mm-hmm. I think it's really dope. But um you know, I would say in my spare time to be doing it, I'd probably rather be hooping. I mean, I don't mean, I don't mean. But I love the fact that what you're doing is bringing people together from a health perspective, right? You're allowing people a safe space to do something different, and you're enjoying nature at the same time. And I think that one of the considerable benefits to hiking is that it does it it really does boost your morale as you're as you're, you know, having physical activity, taking that physical activity to another level, being challenged, is really like really making your body feel better in that aspect. So what are some more considerable benefits that you've learned about since you started hiking? So Kathy and I actually, you joined one of my hikes before. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like it's a, a major team building activity. Um, like there are a lot of the times that I've gone hiking and met up with strangers, but like once the hike is over, I feel like we all like have this bond. Um, also, I, just from a personal perspective, it teaches you that it's possible to just finish, you know, like I'm a start to finish kind of person. So like if I'm looking at it and I know I got three miles left, I'm going to finish the hike. Like I'm just going to finish. And from a like a spiritual perspective, I feel the closest to God when I'm outside, you know, just to kind of like look around and know that like, wow, like look at the trees, you know, like everything around you, know that you had no doing in making any of it. It's just, it's a beautiful feeling. Yeah, it's real. Mm-hmm. Well, you also threw Kathy's name in this too. It sounds like she does some <laughs> yes. of the same thing. So it's, is it similar to that? Yes. Up there? Yes, I would definitely say it's very similar. So yes, that was some time ago. Yeah. Yep. A couple so, years ago. Mm-hmm. Yes, I would say between Erica and another one of my good friends, they kind of introduced me just first, like, you know, just the nature trails and then, you know, bring it up a little bit. But for me, I would say the same thing. It, it really aided in, you know, clarity of mind, you know, being outside, bringing, breathing in that fresh air and just like letting everything, you know, fall off of you. Um, so that's really, you know, why I do it, you know, just to release. It's quiet. It's quiet. You can 
go at your own pace. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay, okay. Y- y'all are convincing me a little bit. Yeah, so I'm just try. saying, you just have to get on the right hike, that's mm-hmm. all. Well, you ever went hiking before? Yeah, I went hiking, like, last time I did, I did, like, three times, but it was the same trail. It was in Cadence or somewhere. Okay. Yeah, I, I enjoyed it. You loved it, right? Yeah, I enjoyed it. Was it. I had a few little times. I mean, I'll do it again. I think, like, like when I wake up, I like to test myself. So mm-hmm. I think once I accomplish something, I want to do something better. So yeah. next time I go hiking, it's going to be a longer trail than I'm used to walk. Mm-hmm. You got two ladies in here that, that I can go. take you to the Billy Goal Trail. Oh, yeah, that's a nice one. It's, mm-hmm. Get your heart moving. Mm-hmm. 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 That's it. Yeah, it seems like you're about to get set up. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, I got a question for you, Erica. Um, there there's, tends to be like a considerable gap mm-hmm. of individuals, preferably African-Americans, that would rather do things inside, right? Even if it's going to the gym, even from a physical aspect. Um, why do you think that hiking lacks di- diversity and inclusion? So I think it's really perception. Um, like I grew up in a in a childhood where my grandfather, like he didn't have a lot of money, mm-hmm. um, but I didn't really know it because all of our activities required something to do with being outside. So it was after he would take us fishing. Um, I learned to play tennis and golf. Um, and these are things that we would do after church. Mm-hmm. So it was like, I look forward to like my outdoor time because it's like the only thing we had. So like now that I've been outside and I'm in nature, I see more brown and black people. Mm-hmm. It's just that I feel like the perception of like we don't belong there. You know, I've been on trails where you can kind of see like if I have a group of 10 black people with me, mm-hmm. they're looking like, what are y'all doing out here? You know, <laughs> um, I've also seen the perception of um, hearing from black people like are you doing white stuff you like you don't like girl stuff so I think it's just realizing like we don't have to just do the typical standard activities that people have like taught us that we have to do like we can do we can be everywhere you know why can't we be outside and camp and fish and swim I don't know how to swim though um, <laughs> but we can do it all you know yeah I like that I like that well you've been in, involved with it but mm-hmm. why do you think it also lacks that diversity and inclusion yeah, I, like you said, I think it's perception because I don't know, but I always feel like, well, I belong here. So, you know what, you know, so when I go to trails and I will say this, I am starting to see more people of color being outside and just enjoying being outside. COVID could have something to do with it, but I think even before that, I think just seeing the black community getting into health and fitness and yeah. being healthy from the inside out, I, I'm seeing an increase in that. But I. I always kind of felt like I'm here, you're here, let's be here together. Yeah, you know, that's right. <laughs> so, outside amongst everyone. Everyone, <laughs> yes. I like that. That's mm-hmm. good. I like that. Well, you both are moms, mm-hmm. you know, and um, and Will's a dad, you know, but I'm, uh, I'm I want to talk to the moms first, really quick, right? Um, according to the National Library of Medicine, when examined by race. Uh, we found that depressed non-Hispanic black mothers compared to depressed non-Hispanic white and Hispanic mothers, they had elevated rates of adversities and were less likely to receive any type of services for their moods, despite, you know, excuse me, say this last part, so my bad. <laughs> um, they were less likely to receive services for their mood disorder in the past year, right? Um, so how do people of color you know, when it comes to mothers specifically, really cope with depression and anxiety, um, you know, in today's age. You want to take this one? Um, sure. Um, I would say, I guess you pick the right people, because for me, that's really what I do. Yeah. I work out for my clarity, my mental clarity. Sometimes people ask, like, why do you work out so much? You don't need to do this. You need your body looks this, your body looks that. I'm like, well, it's not really just that. Like, you don't understand. Like, when I'm stressed after work mm-hmm. or just anything I need to get off my mind it is a true release for me you know and you know working out and being outside it does increase your dopamine your serotonin and all of those good happy chemicals that we really need so that's really one reason why I do it it's like it's like medicine to me Mm -hmm. um so you know some people like to get addicted I'm not addicted but I mean I wouldn't mind being addicted you know to working out (laughs) because it it really it is good for your soul, it's good for your mind, you know, it's good for your confidence. You wake up in the morning, you're clear, you have energy. Um, so that's why I do it. And that has helped me, you know, when I have felt, you know, in a state of depression or 
just going through, you know, life's emotions. I, I think if I could jump in, I would say that, like, women of color, I'm not quite sure if our community actually know what depression is, mm -hmm. you know, actually know, like, depression, anxiety. Mm -hmm. um, so, like, I meet these people, and I can clearly tell from the outside, and, like, oh, she's depressed. Mm -hmm. But in this case, you know, it's just she drinks wine every day, mm -hmm. you know, or she does happy hour every day, or, you know, she's always outside, you know, can never be home with herself. Mm -hmm. So I'm not quite sure if we can actually tackle, you know, those things if we really don't know that they exist in us. Mm -hmm. um, but I do work out for my mental health, mm -hmm. you know. It, it just makes me feel better. That's good. That's good. What are, what are some other things that you do for self-care? So I am big on meditation. Um, so on Thursdays, I during COVID, I um, really prayed about just having some more women in my life, but not like people my age. I just wanted some older women around me. So on Thursdays, I sit with the older ladies and we meditate. And um, it's not like a ceremony, it's not attached to any religion, um, but we send out good blessings to the earth, you know, just basically things that you're thankful for. Mm -hmm. And we say prayers for people who may need things. Um, so meditation has been a, uh, a huge source for me. I love to meditate and just learn to be quiet my mind down some. I like that. That's real. How about you, Kathy? What do you do for self care? Um, so I'm very busy, like seven days a week. So I have to be very intentional about carving out my time for myself. Um, so one thing I do is the same, you know, have an attitude of gratitude, practice that gratitude. So in the morning, um, when I drop my daughter off for school, then after I drop her off, we always say a prayer in the morning to have a good day, to have a kind spirit, to, you know, walk into our spaces as we should. And I say a prayer for myself and anything that I went through the day before, like, God, please help me to, that's yesterday, you know, mm -hmm. to move forward. Um, but then outside of that, I would say just being honest with, you know, those around me, my family, my daughter, that this is what I can do right now, and then I'll I'll get back to you, you know, later. So not taking on too much um, has really helped me and putting up healthy boundaries, but letting them know that if you want the best me, then I need this time for myself. Boundaries is like so mm -hmm. vital. Also, like if I could say one last thing, I have a weekly subscription to a therapist. Okay. I recommend it for everyone. Um, for that, I love yeah. my therapist. Mm -hmm. It is like instead of calling my girlfriends or family members. Mm -hmm. It's like I have an hour session and we just talk about life. And sometimes he helps me see things from a different perspective. Because, you know, we can be our biggest enemy. Mm -hmm. um, but therapy, I, I, tell all, I tell everyone you need a therapist. You know, it's like a life coach to help you get through stuff. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's good. Good stuff. I like that. Mm -hmm. So you heard it from two great fit moms on, you know, really how to cope with anxiety and depression. Because at some point, you know, those, those symptoms that those – Right Gosh, I'm nervous. Just go with it. I'm the one. I'm the man. I'm, this is great. All right. Um, so, you know, even talking through, like, anxiety and depression, right, um, it's really dope that you, you recognize even the unseen symptoms of, like, anxiety and depression, just knowing that, you know, it could be something where a woman is drinking wine or a man is drinking when he comes home, things like that, and not even knowing that he's, he's depressed or he or she is depressed, right? So it's good that you can call those things out and kind of recognize it and also just knowing that boundaries is extremely important to your self-care a lot of times when we're, we don't have boundaries or have weak boundaries and people just can take advantage of us and you know um, manipulate us as well so I think that's really important as well you know, sure. that's the fit dad so we're going to talk through uh, some things when it comes to even being a father right What's, what's one of the most stressful things about being a dad? Um, for me right now, it's just seeing so much going on in the world. It's like, in my head, every time I look at my daughter, I'm just, I'm just thinking, like, am I preparing her the right way? Um, like, am I giving her the tools because, um, am I giving her the tools that's going to help her succeed in life as far as spiritually, physically, mentally, um, those times when daddy's not going to be around, is she going to have a good mindset to even? be able to get through that, you know, that situation, whether it's good or bad, you know, because um, it's like things that she might be dealing with when she gets to a certain age is not the same stuff that I had to deal with at that age. So that's what I think of. And also, I never, I always say to myself when I get in the morning, 
um, of those days when I struggle, like I'm not doing it for me, so and I don't want to fail my daughter, mm-hmm. so let me keep going. That's always just me talking to myself sometimes throughout the day. So most of the time, it's just I just want to see my my daughter do it like we all do. See our kids be better than us, mm-hmm. and it's just setting that setting the stone like you know when mommy and daddy teach you even if we wrong we apologize in advance but this is why we did it so i always you know and i even though my daughter she's four now she's understanding a little bit better i sit and have talks with her about like everyday life she asks a lot of questions so she want to know <laughs> yeah so because uh, I, I know how my dad was he set me down he gave me the real you know i'm not as raw as he was but yeah i sit down and i talk to her and she nods her head or she'll ask questions about what i just said you know, it's just because every day the world changes. You know, mm-hmm. shit. Every day. It's crazy. You know, and it's tough to be not only a parent out here today, but to be a kid because the world is changing. It was different from when we was coming up. Mm-hmm. And certain things you just knew how to conduct yourself as a kid. Now it's just so much confusion out in the world that we got to just really be hyper vigilant with our kids. But then still be able to answer some of those hard questions mm-hmm. and things like that so you know shout out to you for what you're doing as a father for mm-hmm. sure and you're in the fitness now too because you i didn't see you lose like at least 30 40 pounds man like you man you look good brother appreciate it, appreciate <laughs> it. man which so what's the regimen like um at first it started like you know what i'm gonna get the six pack i'm gonna do a bunch of cardio i'm gonna change my whole diet mm-hmm. um i am type 2 diabetic but right. yeah i'm type 2 diabetic so my family would struggle. They had struggles with that. I lost my dad to it. Both my, all my grandparents yeah, too. Yeah. So that's another thing that really got me into fitness. You know, losing my last grandparent with my grandfather back in July. He passed July. I just I went into that depression mode. You know, losing my dad in 2016. Lost a cousin that same year. Lost that same. My dad was October. My grandfather was um, Christmas Eve of that year. So then turning around. You know, then then doing COVID. I lost aunts and uncles, then lost my grandmother, lost a friend to street violence, and then buried another friend, and then a week later, my grandfather finished. So I just started like mentally shutting down everybody around me. And then last year was already a tough year, dealing with last year. So I just started, everyone around me that was loving me, I stopped pushing them away from me. So I was just like, I need an outlet, I need an outlet. I know I like playing football, but it's like, it's just too many people involved, you know? So I just started going to the gym. Like I said, it started off as a cardio, you know, I'm just going try to lose weight. Started losing weight, but I'm just like, you know what, let me start lifting. I started lifting. Next thing you know, I'm on the bench, I'm 275. I'm like, okay, let me keep going there. <laughs> so then I met some other partners at another gym. They like, why don't you just enter a contest as amateur? So I went up to the little amateur event in um, Delaware back in like October, I believe. And I placed out of 200, like 82. That's what's up. So I'm like, you know, I'm gonna stick, I'm gonna stick with it. And keep going. They, you know, then I start learning the sport. So I learned, you know, the bodybuilder side is the side that everybody sees. You know, they see the the rip abs and all that stuff. And I'm yeah. like, you know, I want to go to the other side. So, <laughs> so now I'm more on the strong man side. You know? But when I go in the gym, I zone out. Yeah. So like, I know when I first started, um, like I said, I was in the press mode. So it was times where my gym was open 24 hours. I would go at night because I know sometimes I just wanted to go in there and lift and cry. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. even though to other people he just sweating, I was crying. Mm-hmm. There's times when I go in there, like I like to have my music on. I turn on Sunday, Sunday service, zone out and just kill it. And then you know, I just start building, like building a routine. Then I start realizing now, you know, over time I'm doing two of these. You know, I got to do work at six. I'm getting up four o'clock in the morning, yeah. get off work at two, go to the gym again. Mm-hmm. You know, and then my girlfriend's time was like, you need to slow down, you need to slow down. But for me. I felt like burning myself out and getting that energy out of me the best way I could. You know, I started feeling better. I started wanting to do things more to the point now that it's just a routine now. I'm not doing two of these no more, but, <laughs> but now I'm like more so all into the heavy lifting. I go in and do about an hour of cardio. Mm-hmm. The next we get into it. So that's what's up, man. Yeah, man, I've seen your transformation over the, uh, you know, over the course of several months. And I was like, Hey, you motivate me to go hard. I mean, seriously. <laughs> and when they and piggyback when they say work working out outside, yeah. I went down Miami. I did not intend to, but I seen a gym on the beach. I, I wanted to do that so bad. I did, <laughs> and that was probably the best workout. For real, yes, man. 
I, I'm gonna have to check that out on the beach though. Mm-hmm. I hear Tulum has like the same type of thing where mm-hmm. or something similar. And they got like natural weights down there. Natural weights, mm-hmm. yeah. So y'all want hype, but y'all pick up. <laughs> 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 I do it, but I'm gonna catch up with y'all. <laughs> yeah, I'll catch up with y'all in a bit, you know. But I'll, I think I, I'll try the hiking thing next time I come yeah. to Baltimore. I'll try it. Thank you. That's would that work? Yes. <laughs> All right, cool. So as long as you do it too. <laughs> so all four of us going hiking. Yes. That's what it seemed like. <laughs> All right, so we're going to get into Miss Kathy a little bit. Miss Kathy, tell us a little bit about yourself. Oh, okay. Um, I am a educator, so I'm a school counselor. So um, I've been in Baltimore City Schools for, this is coming up on 14 years, I believe. Wow. Mm. I know. Um, so I've taught pretty much all grade levels, and then I went into school counseling um, my fifth year um, of being an educator. Um, so I love children. Um, I want to see how you be everything that they can be. Um, I went that path because at the time when I started, my daughter was very small. Um, and I saw that, and I taught young kids at the time, I taught pre-K and kindergarten, and I saw that we were trying to force the children to grow up too fast. They didn't, they needed, you know, a lot of emotional care. They needed a lot of nurturing that we were just like, no, you have to sit down, you have to, you can't move, you have to write your name in two weeks, you know, mm-hmm. just things that were unrealistic for little kids. Right. Um, and then also I saw, you know, some of the parenting at the time, and I'm just like, I don't know if that's the right thing to say to a four-year-old. Mm-hmm. Um, and then at the time, I'm young, at the, and I'm like, what is happening here? So um, my passion for children and seeing them grow and seeing them be the best versions of themselves and pouring into them. So I give that to my students, and I give that to my daughter. So... I'm a counselor. Killing it. I, Killing I, I it. I love people and kids. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, you definitely seem like it's, it seems like it's the perfect role mm-hmm. for you because you're like one of the most friendliest people I know. <laughs> <laughs> <Thank> you. <laughs> so you definitely, it definitely fits you just being a people's person mm-hmm. and things like that. So shout mm-hmm. out to you for that. Thank you. So let's talk about, you know, co-parenting for a minute. Mm-hmm. I know that you are, you're a is it, uh, single mother? Um, Single-ish mother? Um, I mean, depends on what you call single. Um, I would say single-ish. Single-ish. There you go. Okay. So, single-ish fit mom. Yes. All right. So, being with, with co-parenting, at mm-hmm. least, right, um, what are some ways that you can make life easier for the other parent as or, and yourself as you guys strive to keep the, the children's needs at the root of the relationship? Um, I would say to make it easier, it's just like a meeting of the minds, mm-hmm. you know, keeping the child in focus and remembering that we love this child. And I think that that has been the most helpful thing in making it easy because she's our common goal. Mm -hmm. We want to see her be everything that she can be in life. Um, But outside of that, some practical ways, you know, just being flexible, um, agreeing. Mm -hmm. Sometimes when you might not want to agree, as parents, we have to be on one accord, even in different households. Um, That has definitely helped. Um, and also from the parent perspective, I would say, you know, forgiving, letting what happened or what didn't happen, letting it go. Because again, we have a child that was created in love at the time. Mm -hmm. So let's keep that there with her. So that has been the most powerful um, aspect of co-parenting for for us. But I would say flexibility, being open, cooperating with one another, agreeing to disagree, and just being on one accord to help the most. I like that. Mm-hmm. That's good. That's good. So, so you're approaching 40 pretty soon, is that correct? Yeah. Dope, dope. Well, you know, Miss Fit Mom approaching 40. You know, I think that's a really great thing that we were just talking about, you know, how to stay fit. Um, but I want to know from your perspective, you know, how do you stay fit, you know, into your, while you're approaching your, your 40, your 40. Um, just making my schedule. Um, I would say, I don't know, it's something about, it's like every generation, you turn 20, oh, I'm 20, <laughs> you turn 30, and it's like, oh my God, I'm about to be 40. It's like a totally different. High pressure. It's like pressure. But I would say the older I get, the more comfortable 
you know, I am with myself and I would say that, you know, more confident. Um, so for me, it's more just about maintaining my health um, so that I am able to be present with my child and to interact with the world, you know, and to really be my best self. You know, sometimes I know we were younger, we thought 40 was old, you know, <laughs> and I'm like, I'm not old, what do you mean? Um, so just, you know, maintaining myself for my health, you know, so like as you mentioned, you know, like the different stages of working out first, it starts with cardio, then you go, you know, you find what works for you, you know, and so for me, Definitely weightlifting. I love lifting too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I'm so glad, like now, um, with the, I guess you want to call it beauty standards or whatever you want to call it, I'm so glad, like, being skinny is not the thing anymore. Because now it's like, you know, you can have a body and it looks good and it's natural and it's kind of no fix, you know? So it's so weird. It's like, why close like it before? Like, now I finally settled into my body. It's like weird, you know? But that's our motivation on the channel. So, what are some things that as far as like do you, uh, like chest day and mixed thing with some supersets like what what is your uh, regimen look like so i do have a trainer that i work with and he teaches me lots of things um but when i go on my own i do i start off with cardio i do about 20 minutes of cardio it depends on sometimes i do it first sometimes i do it after okay. um but yeah so i focus it um a lot on core i do a lot of core work um then i have my leg day um squats weighted squats it's so many ways to do <laughs> <laughs> um, I do my arms, and some days I do like a whole body day, um, you know, counting your reps. So, um, yeah, I focus it on different areas that I want to you know, improve on, but ultimately, whole body is where you can really go. Okay. So, um, what about like meal preps? Do you, are you involved in meal prepping, or do you just, is there like a, a, any type of health conscious things that you eat? Um, so, I'm a very simple eater. Very, very simple. So for me, I, I do meal prep when I have time to do meal prep, but mostly, um, again, very simple. I have like a bag, bag of salads. So Bill kind of like has all the stuff in, like the cabbage and everything. <laughs> From Wegmans. From Wegmans. <laughs> <laughs> you know, portable, add my vegetables, and like really, really simple. So my face salad is not like one I have to be so creative with it. Um, but I try to make sure, of course, you're getting your protein your vegetables, your fruits, you just kind of really make it down. Out. I don't leave anything really out of my diet. Um, and then I also, you know, allow, you know, time for things that, you know, like chicken and cake and things like that because I still live life, yeah. you know. That's fish fries for me. <laughs> <laughs> right. So um, yeah. I just make sure it's healthy. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, I love how you said you know, meal prep when you can, mm-hmm. because you said you're busy seven days a week, mm-hmm. so meal prepping is probably the last thing mm-hmm. you're thinking about, but mm-hmm. still being able to keep in your proteins, your vegetables, and mm-hmm. even your snacks, the cakes, and things like mm-hmm. that. Like, you're not, you're not competing for anything. Right. You're just having a good time trying to just build our body up, continue mm-hmm. to build it up. So mm-hmm. that's a good good regimen. I like that. Mm-hmm. I'm going to ask you, Will, what do you, uh, how do you meal prep, or like, do you meal prep or anything like well, that? Well, at first I started having cheese on the salad. Was the more heavy I lift, the hungry I get. Yeah. So, and with the, like with my new job, like I'm, I'm supervising over a certain region, so I'm on call all the time. Okay. So it's gonna be on times when I'm not gonna have a chance, you know, on a Sunday to make sure I have those the whole week. So most of the time, but my diet is always the same. It's a lot of protein. Um, I do look at a little bit of fruit in there, but I like vegetables. Like I was gonna do that. Love vegetables. So I can eat like steamed vegetables with a slice of salmon. You know, I can eat steamed vegetables with some fish or something like that. I'm not too big on fry. I think the best thing in life that was created was an air fryer. That is my <laughs> that is my best friend. Yeah. Like, but I found that I didn't have to go and I know how to cook, but just standing over grease and making a mess. <laughs> I'm like, yes. And then I realized how much um, healthier it was. Like, so that that helps a lot. But most of the time, it's seafood and vegetables for me. In the morning, I might eat like five eggs, five, five, or oh, egg whites, depending on how I'm lifting. And then I do like my snack the other day, to be honest, is this corn and bean butter. Hey, I'm good job. That's how I get that. It's not too bad. And then also, even in diabetic though, it's been helping as far as like keeping my levels and stuff good. I never, even as a kid, been a big snacker. I just have, I'm a sucker for key lime pie. But that's something you gotta purposely go out your way and get. Yeah. So, really, the only time I get that is if I'm in the grocery store and just having a seed or something. But 
So you know, as far as my diabetes, the all that's under control. So I didn't at this point I don't want to like mess up with the big thing. So like that, man. Last but not least, Sarah, what are you doing to stay fit? So uh, working out, um, I work out six days a week. I I do the morning shift, so I'll go to the gym by like five thirty in the morning. I have three little twins. So I have to do this while they're asleep. When I come back, I shower, get myself dressed, get them ready, and I go. I function well on routine. So for me, Sundays is like my prep for the week. I meal prep. Um, at least if I can get three meals, because I'm not going to like go hard and just do like everything, but I get like three good meals done. That lightens the load for me like when I'm coming home and I'm like, okay, that's one less thing I have to do. So that helps me. But for the weekend, it's definitely brunch. Like, I, I don't even look by schedule. I'm eating waffles and chicken and fries. But I'm good throughout the week, though. Okay. Yeah. So, you guys all have a good, different type of palate going on. But like, it, I had a salad before I got here, and it was like the best salad ever. You know, I love eating salad for whatever reason. You know, that was amazing. That was good. Yeah. It depends yeah. on where you eat yeah. it from. I'm about to ask yeah. you. Mm-hmm. Man, have y'all been to the spot in Columbia Mall? Where they it's like right by the food court and it's on the end right where the entrance is and it's I mean, some of those yes not that that's that's it. <laughs> but you got to like sweet she talking nah, about the cinnamon it's not a cinnamon but then you're looking right at that because it's like an L shape but you see that first yeah I know exactly what you're talking about. That's that's like, like, I eat a lot sometimes I get wraps from there yeah we got good wraps yeah. that was like nostalgic being there today and just getting uh getting a salad from there. But I'm I'm a sucker for sweets. Any of my friends that know me know me that I love like sour patch kids or <laughs> sour gummy worms, you know those types of things. Like tart sweets. I like tart sweets. Yeah, mm-hmm. I I will literally sift through a big bag in like a quarter. So mm-hmm. I need I need to chill out. <laughs> Yikes! <laughs> I know, right? The sugar rush is real. <laughs> so I want to touch on something a little serious. And it's based on uh, something that's really important that we're talking about and knowing when it comes to mental health is that you, but it's mostly around transgenerational trauma. Um, transgenerational trauma refers to a type of trauma that does not end with the individual. Instead, it lingers and gnaws from one generation to the next. So families with a history of unresolved trauma, depression, anxiety, and addiction, it may pass, you know, from you know, one person to the next, the child, the grandchildren. And what we can do is we have these maladaptive coping strategies and disruptive views of life once a future generation is pretty much. Um, in this way, one can repeat the same patterns and attitudes of former generations, regardless of if they're healthy or if they're not healthy. So transgenerational trauma isn't something that can be easily pinpointed. It's often covert, it's undefined, it's subtle, and it surfaces through family patterns and forms of hypervigilance, mistrust, um, and it really hits at self-esteem in a big way. Right? So, Kathy, I'm going to start with you. Um, what are some things that you've seen in maybe your own family to where transgenerational trauma has been passed down from one generation to the next? Um, in my family, it would definitely be in strike on the election issue where you had, well, you know what? Divorce. Mm-hmm. I've been divorced. I've never been married. Um, but my parents were married, but seeing them be, get divorced, then my mother became a single parent. And I've seen that with pretty much every one of my family. So we have a strong presence of women. Um, and our men, they're not pushed to the side. They're just not, it's like they internalize what has happened. And then they, they were not present. Um, in our lives, the way that they could have been. And not dominant. Not dominant, dominant, yes. So when I mean by present, I mean more so like um, emotionally present. Financially, stability wise, yes, but emotionally and building that connection, you know. Um, so that's where I've seen it manifest in my family, not just with my mother, but with like, my cousins and my, you know, my extended family. Yeah, yeah uh, divorce is a huge transgenerational. Down, you know, from one one generation to the next, um, 
I've seen both of my parents get divorced and married and, and that passed down to me as I've been divorced as well. And I think what it stems from is it stems from the lack of knowledge, number one. Um, and then the, the trauma comes when you see these negative toxic behaviors and you think that those behaviors are normal. So, and, and then you have to think that there's there's a scientific situation that's going on as well because your brain now, your brain doesn't even function from a normal, you know, a, a normal mode of nothing more than survival. So now we have to figure out how to, how to break the cycle, but also deal with the, the scientific aspect, the emotional aspect, the, the physical aspect, these things that are all the time. So, and divorce is one of the hardest things that a person can go through to be affected. So I do. Sure. Sure. But you, Erica? So I was thinking, I was listening, but I was thinking. And I would say for my family, um, my dad's side is completely different than my mom's side of the family. And I didn't quite realize that until I got older. So, like, my dad's side of the family, there is a strong male presence. Um, like, they're actually in the kitchen, they're very nurturing men. Like they greet you with hugs and compliments and they're at the table when we're talking and they're very pro-family. Uh, however, that's not the side of the family that I was submerged in. I was submerged in uh, my parents' background story. They met when they were seven, um, had me at 16, uh, but they were so young. They never ended up together. Um, so the family that I grew up with mainly was my mom's side of the family, which was hyper-independent. Um, the men were around, but they didn't have a strong presence. So I don't, I don't think it was until I got older that I had like a high appreciation for my dad's side of the family and the men um, because of how compassionate they are. Um, I feel like they, um, that is the trauma though, when you're growing up with just one side of the story. You don't get the opportunity to really um, understand men and really understand the different sides of men have conversations with them so if you're really submerged with just one side of the story subconsciously you know you don't really have a blueprint on what to date who to marry you know who to be with and i feel like for a lot of women um, including myself and others when you don't have the blueprint you make subconscious mistakes you know but when you have really like the conversations with the men that you need in your life you get to hear the stories and you understand you know who you're after a lot more and sometimes we get like, so sometimes we get like, like you said, two sides of the story. So we might see some of the good things, but some of those other things are absent. Yeah. You know, like for me personally, like stability wise, you know, career wise, educationally, my father had it down. It was like this, 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 and this. But the connecting piece is the piece that has always been missing for me. And it's something I had to go actively go after as of when I became an adult. Like, Oh, dad, like, what are you going to do today? I'm here, you know, I'm going to give you some dinner, you know, I had to really build that relationship. Intimacy. Those memories I have. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you put yourself out there, you know, vulnerability-wise to know what, how is this going to go. This may or may not go in that way, so it takes a lot of courage to put yourself out there and know what you're doing, you know, because sometimes I feel as though our parents should be the ones that should be doing some of these things, but it, they did the best they could with what they had, right? Yeah. And that's the one thing that we have to when we think about the things that we're lacking from them. I think we're the generation that knows better. Yeah. So it's mm-hmm. like, we're the generation that's like actively trying to heal. Like we're talking about things like in today. Mm-hmm. So like when you have that much awareness, like it, it's our duty, you know, to kind of reach back and grab them. Although I think in our mind, like they should be right here reaching for us. Right. But sometimes we have to reach back and grab them. Mm-hmm. All right, well, so how about you? What are some, you know, some traumas that you might have faced, you know, even family-wise? For me, um, like, I've always had family in my life, but the downside of that is they had traumas. Mm-hmm. So it's like that generation of curse on their fathers or the two good fathers, because when they became, so as a me, when I got an older cousin, and he had a brother, um, we dealt with the pain of that. Like, we dealt with the pain of having fathers who, their main concept of being husbands and fathers was just to provide. And so I was getting to know who their kids were, getting to understand who their wife was, who they were married to, the rules and regulations of being married and stuff like that. Like, 
they me personally, I feel like I had to grow up a lot faster because of the things I heard and experienced as a kid in the household. Um, my father, and then when I was younger, I couldn't understand. I couldn't understand why it was so much tension between me and him. I'm like, we had the same name. You made me, like, you know, why, why am I getting treated like this? Even as when I started um, getting recruited in high school as, a, as an athlete, like, I felt like that was probably the closest time when he started to realize, you know, somebody, somebody outside of him wanted to experience who I was. Mm-hmm. And then uh, there was one time the recruiter was talking to him and asking him questions about me. He couldn't really answer. You know, he was looking for my mother for assistance, and that right there really got to him. Like, I don't even want to be that type of person, you know. I, I want to be able to know, like, on the back, without even actually thinking, like, questions about my child, I want to know. Even if it's something I feel like they hide, I'm just going to take the guess. So, um, just growing up and seeing uncles and my father and even my grandfather, seeing their relationship was all these strange. And it seemed like every time the relationship got good, someone left. Like, my father and his father got real, real close. Me and my father got real, real close, then my father was gone. And, you know, after my father left, I got real, real close to my grandfather, and he was gone. You know, same day with uncles and stuff like that. I had one uncle, two uncles left. And, you know, and I'm close to them, but at the same time, I think they started the trend of breaking that curse, you know, dealing with their kids. You know, I had one uncle who has, like, he has four kids, all my little cousins, and, you know, they're all adults too, but I can tell, like, even to this day, like, he's on. And I think for him, it's clicking, like, you know, basically, he's the last one left, you know, as far as, like, being on my dad's side. Um, and then my uncle on my mother's side, he's raising his son by himself. He's an older kid, but he's by himself, raising a six-year-old, eight-year-old. So, I mean, he's breaking that curse. So, for me, personally, and my older cousin, we was like, we had our kids. We're not doing this. Like, you know, we, we can't. We can't be so. We've had, but actually, a conversation. We, it was a time when we felt like our fathers were living through us. Mm-hmm. Like not too long ago, like I, I had to sit down with my cousin. Like I'm making the same mistakes my father did. You know, not 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 realizing what type of female I wanted in my life and just being stable. You know, I'm getting into that mindset where all I want to do is work and make sure my daughter got place on the table. But am I actually taking the time out to realize? You know, what do I have in front of me? What's at stake? So I had to fix that part of me. And that's, that comes with a lot of black men. We don't want to fix ourselves. Mm-hmm. Like we want we want the world to baby us and baby and just accept us for who we are. At the same time, we gotta realize we hurt the people around us. Like I never I never looked at it through that way. But then when I started seeing people like my mother, my sister avoiding me or being down to my, my girlfriend at the time, didn't know what to say to me and stuff at the time and the other family members like don't invite him, you know, he's a high head and stuff like that. And for me, I'm seeing it like, y'all know I'm dealing with hurt and pain right now. But to them, it's like, you need to open up to us. Mm-hmm. So I went and got third. You know, I you went and had, <laughs> I never thought yeah. for an hour and a half I could sit and talk to somebody like that. They don't even know. Yeah. And so when I started doing that, I started opening up more. I started realizing, like, I'm just basically, I said I was going to break the cycle, but really I'm doing the same thing over and over again. Like, I was that, I was that child not knowing how to approach my dad about certain situations because I didn't know how he was going to react to it. Yeah. You know, I was that child coming into a household where you know it was just a big argument because mom is over here, daddy over there. They ain't talked a couple days. You know why your mother crying. You know what your father done did. So now you thinking, you thinking, oh, I got to be a man in the house now. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you and your father now colliding because now you're taking that for your mother. So I was just like, you know, stuff like that can be trauma. So even now when I had situations as far as relationships, Every time I would say something like that, I ran. I was like, I didn't want to do that. You know, I, I didn't want to put my daughter in a certain predicament, so I ran when I said, and I, maybe that wasn't the best idea thing to do, but at the same time, my trauma, my childhood, that's the first thing to quit because there's been moments when I was a teenager and I looked at my mother like, why don't I get a divorce? You know, right. my mother was the type of person, I took a vow on the God, like I'm gonna live through that fear. And when she did, my father died in her arms. So she was just there all the way to the end. Same thing with my aunts who, who, who lost her. Like got, her husband got killed. She was there all the way to the end of all that. And I'm like, I don't ever want to put a female in that predicament where I done put her through so much through the marriage. Yeah. And she stuck by my side the whole time, all the way to the end. Now she left hanging, hanging you know. Yeah. So I was like, we got to do something better. So me and my cousin, we talked. I go to therapy. I, I, 
sometimes I just gotta go outside and take a walk, you know. And even I might do out my prayers and stuff, I ask God to send me send me like some guidance, like send me like some some better role models and stuff. Even people is I'm not a personal relationship, like I stick to myself, but you know, send me somebody that I can just look towards and you know what? I know I'm doing kinda of doing something with you doing, so I'm gonna keep going. So that, that's the thing. That was refreshing, by the way. Or somebody that's willing to be there to show us the real police officer that helps us do it. We need somebody that's walking alongside you, somebody that's on that same level. That way, y'all can kind of relate, be able to bounce things off of each other and be there for one another. And then you need somebody that you're looking behind that you can pull with you as a mentee. So, somebody that's looking up at you. And it, what it does for all three of those types of individuals is that it gives us motivation to keep being better each and every day. Not perfect. But understanding that it's a process that we want to fight that you know, really trying to break the cycle. Mm-hmm. And to break the cycle with us means that we're gonna to have to go through a little bit more mm-hmm. a little bit more things because of the pain and, mm-hmm. and the things that they're so rooted into that trauma. So it is important for us to go through those things and to get therapy in order to and talk about those things and go to the people that might have hurt us or wronged us and, and try to resolve those issues that's what you know how to do. So I applaud all of y'all for really having all of those things and to really taking those steps. Um, you know, I just a little bit of background about me. Um, you know, my parents divorced when I was six years old. And my dad was, uh, I had his name, just like Will, you had your dad's name. And I just never understood why my dad hated me so much, but felt like he hated me. Because it seemed as if though I was closer to my mom and I had a unique personality, so I was able to connect with all kinds of people. More of a people person then that I, I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm still in, but this pandemic has turned my social anxiety up a notch like crazy. But you know, I was able to just always connect with people, and I felt as if my father just, just liked the fact that people liked me. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, the abuse would come in, the physical abuse, the, the gaslighting, the, all these types of negative things that you know that a child would go through, and that creates trauma. And so I did the same thing. I would always say, I don't want to be like my father. I want to be like my father. But the problem was, was that because I had so much unresolved trauma, the same things that he was doing, I, I would find myself doing. You know, and it would be, it would even be situations where, even from a biblical aspect, where it's like, where I want to do good, evil is present right there. So you got a decision to make. And when you got trauma right there, it's harder to make the good decision and the better decision based off of was what subconsciously we, we are accustomed to doing. So I, I just think it, it takes a lot of courage for all of us. You know, we all in the same boat in some way, shape, or form, trying to break generational curses. So I, I, I really applaud everybody for that. Um, one more question I have for you, Kathy, is how do we crush transgenerational trauma to create like a brighter future for our kids? So. Um, Going back to the conversation about the voice, I would say for my child, I emphasize the relationship that she has with her father. Um, because I want her to have that strong relationship. Now, granted, that's two different people. Um, but, you know, I reinforce to her the love that he has for her, how she should be as a daughter, and, you know, and what he does for her. So I just really try to highlight that and I remind her how blessed she is and I, um, you know, just, just give her that sense of, you know, being grateful, um, but also playing her, I'm not going to say playing her role as a daughter, but um, just being in that space and allowing that love to really flow through her. Um, so I would say really showing respect for him coming from me, you know, and that really helps. So that way there's no wedge that's grown between father and daughter. Okay. Well, you definitely need more moms like you. Uh, I was seeing something on Instagram that was circulating through, and it was a woman on a podcast, and she says that she would, she would not 
reach out to her baby brother under any circumstance. Like, even if you cut off her right arm, she not she not gonna hit him up for anything. And I feel as though that's such a such a bad thing to do. Mm-hmm. You create mm-hmm. another mm-hmm. another cycle mm-hmm. to because while you under you want your child to be independent, but you still want them to have that healthy relationship with their father, seeing that mommy needs help, so I can call daddy. And daddy might be right there to help. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So why do we do that? I was going to say, like, the level of, I saw that same podcast and I had so many issues with that. Um, the level of barriers that women and men set themselves up for when relationships end are just so stupid. Mm-hmm. Like, especially when there are children involved. Um, this this hyper independence, like, proving, like, I don't need nobody to help me take care of my kid. It's just, like, that's never been me. Like, help me, please. Please, 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 help, me. please help me. Yeah, yeah. I need help with this child. Please. <laughs> um, and I think it, it has, like, when we do these things, it sets up a disservice to the child mm-hmm. because it creates this thing that superhero mom did it all. Mm-hmm. And, like, this is what I should be expecting mm-hmm. of women. And that it's just, like, it's one-sided. It's, it's not true. And I, to go back to what you said, um, my daughter and I, we, her father and I, I, I think I could say we, we had a shaky intro of co-parenting. Um, but when the light bulb went off in my head and I taught myself that, like, this is for her, mm-hmm. you know, I, I, I will be uncomfortable for her. I will be around him when I don't want to for her. Mm-hmm. You know, I will call for her. I will ask for help for her because it's for her, mm-hmm. you know, and I'm not going to, like, put myself in predicaments to struggle um, when I don't have to, yeah. when I know that he's available, mm-hmm. and I need her to see that it took two of us to raise you. You know, I didn't do this all of myself. So I don't know why we do that, but it, it is uh, it's sad mm-hmm. um, for people to sign up mm-hmm. to struggle. Yeah, yeah, I'm not really trying to help you at all. <laughs> help me. <laughs> Hashtag. Yeah. Help me. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Especially when you're willing to do this. Yeah. That's the thing. Yeah. And it's also like, you know, when you're with him, you know, modeling to our children. This is how you interact, yeah. you know? You are our dream. This is what we want. You yeah. know, you're our light. So um, just modeling that respect and the communication. And sometimes I might say, well, you want you want to do this? Ask your father. You know, he doesn't live in our house, but still ask your father. What does he think? And we have, like, a, a collaborative conversation to help her make decisions. Um, and then also showing her to, you know, lean on him, mm-hmm. you know? I know, I mean, I still believe in, you know, the role of a man, and I want her to know that, Absolutely. you know. So you mean as your father, you need that. You need that your dad. I'm, I don't want to do it. <laughs> I can, but I don't want to. I think it also goes back to something Will said um, earlier about like passing down trauma, mm-hmm. because like what I find in some cases when I'm looking at young women, and I try my best to like talk with them, like the relationship ended. Okay, mm-hmm. grieve that part. But there are, there's still something else that's happening, which is the child. And I think what happens in some cases, men and women, uh, when they don't grieve the relationship ending, there's like bitterness, mm-hmm. you know? So it's like, I don't even want to be around her. You know, I don't want to be around him. You know, F her, I'm not calling. You know, now the person says like, they're your baby mom. Mm-hmm. And they get this treatment. But it's like, at the end of the day, like this is a, the person who like gave you this child that you love. And when we don't grieve and process, um, the children feel it, you know, and that's the disproportionate part. So the moral of the story is heal. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Heal. That's the biggest thing. Let's let's start having conversations amongst one another. If you can't afford mental health services, you know, find conduits that you know people who have experienced certain things and they can be able to walk alongside like and do life with you. Yeah. You know, you gotta have somebody that's kind of being a bridge for you. So I think healing is, is definitely has been the theme mm-hmm. for sure, you know, amongst us, you know, and, and we all still work in progress in our ways, but mm-hmm. that's the beautiful thing about life. You can be able to see where you were, allow God to groom you and, and mold you and shape you and then get on to another level and then there's more challenges in that next level. And then you gotta be able to navigate through it, find clarity, find peace through that. So y'all doing it up. Y'all are the real yeah. deal. <laughs> That's the biggest thing that I definitely have taken from y'all. So appreciate that for sure. All right, so we're going to jump into it. Um, we're going to jump into In the Chair. 
So just so y'all know, in the chair is a really dope part about the show. It's like a version of the hot seat, but with a little shot flavor to it. In the chair allows us to learn a little bit about our guests and have a little fun at the same time. So I'll pose a couple of questions to our guests individually, and they must answer them without explanation and pretty much within 30 to 45 seconds. Okay. So I'm gonna let y'all get at it. All right. So who's down? Tell Kathy she can't read the questions. Okay. You cannot ask, he cheated. Cannot look at the questions, ma'am. All right. All right. So first up in the chair is Kathy. Okay. Are right, you ready? Okay. Idris Elba or Method Man? Method Man. Okay. Yes. <laughs> what is something that makes you uncomfortable? The first thing that comes to your mind. Um, I'm really shy. You're really shy. I'm very bashful. Um, I don't like a lot of attention. Okay. All right. So she's shy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. We gonna get back to that. Okay. <laughs> What's your favorite hobby right now? Working out. Working out? Mm-hmm. Okay. Would you rather go to a concert or a comedy show? Mm. Ooh, that is a tough one. I can't do both? Nope. <laughs> um, I'm into concerts right now. Concerts, mm-hmm. okay. What is something that men say that makes women angry? How old are you? How old are you? Mm-hmm. Okay. Don't add that. Well, <laughs> oh, how much do you weigh? How much do you I weigh? I get that one a lot. What? Kathy, how yeah. much do you weigh? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, how old are you? It's kind of been a compliment here lately because I get that a lot. Okay. Yeah. So, so how much do you weigh? How much do I weigh? Yeah. All right. Perfect. Uh-huh. 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 <laughs> All right. Um, skydiving. Sky. Let me go back to that. Skydiving or scuba diving? I would say skydiving. 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 I had to choose. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. Here's a good one. Your man in a suit or gray sweatpants? Gray sweatpants. <laughs> All day. <laughs> <So crazy. laughs> All right. Last but not least, what is your love language? My love language, um, definitely quality time. Okay. And uh, physical touch. Physical touch. So quality time mm-hmm. and physical touch. QT and PT. <laughs> Thank you, Kathy. Appreciate that. All right. Miss Erica, you're up next. All right. Method Man or Idris Elba? I'm Idris. Idris. Team Idris out here. Team Idris. What is something that makes you uncomfortable? Uh, being lied to. Okay. What's your favorite hobby right now? I would say writing. Writing? Yeah. Okay. Would you rather go to a concert or a comedy show? This is so hard. I feel all, I'm always down for a good laugh, though. Oh. So I'll go for the comedy show. Comedy show, okay. Skydiving or scuba diving? Skydiving. Skydiving. What's something that men say that make women angry? Uh, um, that's all you? Like talking about body parts. Like, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Like, this is not a BBL. <laughs> <laughs> um, your man in a suit or gray sweatpants? I like a good suit. A suit? Okay. Yes. Okay. And what's your favorite love language? Or what is your love language? So I'm quality times uh, well and words of affirmation. Quality time and words of affirmation. Okay. I like it. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Erica. Would it be Will? Oh, wow. <laughs> All right. Yes, Miss Will. Mr. Will. <laughs> Mr. Will. All right. Um, Chloe or Holly? Doug. Um, Chloe. Chloe? Okay. What's something that makes you uncomfortable? Um, clutterness. I do not like junk. I mean, it's got to be organized. I can't think of clutter. Can't think of clutter. Okay. All right. What's your favorite hobby right now? Um, Cigar. Cigar. Okay. Cigar bar. All right. Would you rather go to a concert or a comedy show? Comedy. Comedy. Okay. What is one thing that women say that make men angry? I don't know. Well, for me, I hate when a female. First thing she says is, "Well, you must have a lot of ladies." I do not like that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Assuming. Especially when you try to be the next. 
Don't worry about who I am. Yikes. Don't worry about who I am. That's who I am. I'm going to cut. That's how I do. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so you think it's off the roster? Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's the quickest way. That's the quickest way. Okay. Um, skydiving or scuba diving? I've done scuba diving. It's like an hour or so a few hours. So, so yeah. scuba. I think I'm gonna go with skydiving. Go skydiving. Oh. <laughs> okay. All right. Your woman in boy shorts or sundress? Mm. I don't say boy shorts because she got a sundress. She outside the house. Yeah. Oh, right. Okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> What's your love language? I know I like physical touch. And, um, I, don't, I don't know if it's a love. I like to show off my leisure. Like if I feel like I got something special on my shoulder, whatever, it's leisure. Okay. Whatever like that might fall under. Physical touch, probably. <laughs> 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 no, I like that. Appreciate getting to know y'all a little bit better. That was, that was dope. All right, well, before we go, um, you know here at the Locks Lounge, we are always living to overcome cultural stereotypes. So, you know, real briefly, would there be, what would be one cultural stereotype that you have probably noticed that you want to overcome? I'll start with you, Um, definitely the fact, black people don't care about that black women should be unhealthy, that we should be, you know, out of shape. Okay. Okay. What you know? Um, to be honest, it's okay to love. It's okay to love one another. You know, it's not there's not always that tension between us. Like even if we agree or disagree, but at the end of the day we still got each other because sometimes that's just all it comes down to, you know, just a talk. Or just a, you know, just a how by, because I realize in a lot of situations it just needs miscommunication, really, yeah. and that's just stopping the love between one another. Okay. Good. What you got? So I think I'm learning just from like listening to all of us is like it's okay to do things different. Mm-hmm. You know, even if we haven't seen it this way before, mm-hmm. it's okay to be the first. You know, the first to talk about therapy, the first to be transparent with your children, the first to talk about forgiveness. Like, it's okay to just be different than what we saw growing up. Yeah, Yeah, I think those are some good cultural stereotypes that we definitely are overcoming. We're getting better at. And we see it more on social media all the time. There are so many success stories of black families staying together. We'll see a lot of black families overcoming different things when it comes to how they parent their children. Like we we definitely come a long way, you know, so that's so definitely a good thing also we can see. So um, real quick, you know, I wanted to make sure that the viewers know and our audience knows where they could uh, find you guys at. So um, you know we're gonna do the Twitter handles and all those things. So I'm gonna go ahead and start with you Erica. Where can where can everybody find you at? Uh, they can find me on Hike to Heal on Instagram. So it's hike H I K E the number two and then heal. Hike to heal. Yeah, Instagram. Sounds good. All right. Thank you, Miss Erica. How about you, Miss Kathy? Next lady. Um, well, I have Instagram. It's Kit Kat Brat, K I T T B R A T T Brat. <laughs> Kit Kat Brat. Um, and then also I have another Instagram page. It's called Brick House Fitness. Um, I'm not, I can't remember the underscore or all that, but if you type it in. Perfect. Thank you, Miss Kathy. Last but not least, my boy Will. Um, find me on IG. I'm on there most of the time. Um, it's my middle name, Miles, M I L E S, with the number three, R D, the third. Yes, sir. Appreciate you, Mr. Will. Please ride. Well, that's where you can find all of our great guests tonight um, on Instagram and, and their handles. So definitely look them up for more information, being able to connect with them um, just on Instagram and things like that. So thank you again very much for joining us here at the Locks Lounge with your boy and your host, Tim Nicholas. Please make sure that you like, share, and follow the Locks Lounge podcast on IG, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube, where we are living to overcome cultural stereotypes. Be blessed. Have a good night.